As we start this next section of the course, we're going to be looking at a very specific organ system, namely the nervous system. This is an organ system that is really critical. It arguably influences all of the other organ systems in our bodies. And so it's a good place to start because it's gonna set this large framework uh, that will provide co some context for um, really the remainder of the semester. We're going to start off with just the uh, kind of the overall structure of the nervous system and then after that we'll get into function. How, how does it function and how does it influence things to happen in the context of physiology? So as far as overall structure goes, the nervous system is divided into two main sections. There's what we refer to as the central nervous system and for that word central I'd like for you to think about central in terms of the body. It's very central, it's kind of right down the middle. The central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. And then the other component is the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral means kind of off to the side, and that, that fits with, with where this is located. The peripheral nervous system includes the nerves that branch off from uh, the central nervous system. And then these would go and um, permeate throughout the rest of the body. As far as the tissue goes, the tissue that makes up the nervous system, there are gonna be two major cell types that we will be looking at, two different types of cells that make up the nervous system. Neurons, these are really the key players. Neurons, this is the name for the cell type that's able to conduct impulses, electrical impulses. We'll be seeing how that happens a little bit later on. Um, and generally, these are cells that are not capable of dividing. So they have a very specific, very defined role. They send signals, but they're not particularly able to undergo cell division. The other type of cell that makes up the nervous system is what we would refer to as glial cells or neuroglia. And the neuroglia, really what they do is they support the activities of the neurons. So these are like the main players, the neurons, and then the neuroglia, these are the supporting cells. Neuroglia are not capable of sending signals, but they are capable of dividing, and they're very important for maintaining the environment around neurons. We're going to look at each of these cell types in order. Let's start with neurons. A neuron is the type of cell that allows electrical impulses to be sent throughout our bodies. And the way that that happens is through the use of chemical ions. We'll be seeing this in more detail coming up very shortly here. What this is going to allow is a lot of different things in the body. This is going to allow, um, allow stimulation of regulators to be released so that signaling can happen throughout the body. Uh, this is also what's going to allow us to voluntarily activate muscles, skeletal muscles, the way that muscle contractions are initiated is through a signal arriving from a neuron. In the brain specifically, so in the central nervous system, the action of neurons is what allows us to perceive the world around us. So sensory stimuli, the way that we can sense things is through the action of neurons. Um, the way that we can learn things and store memories is all through the action of neurons. And we'll be spending some time later on in the semester talking about muscles and glands the way that those are activated is through uh, signaling from, from neuron cells. So you can see neurons do a lot of different things. They cause a lot of different things to happen, um, but they all kind of have some, some key things in common. Let's just start with the structure. So in general, neurons all have three things in common. They can vary in terms of size and shape, but some things that they all have in common are as follows. They all have a cell body. So this is the site where the nucleus would be located. Let me just point to these figures over here. So right here is a cell body on this neuron. Um, right here is a cell body on this other neuron. And then if you'll notice, these cell bodies have lots of extensions or projections coming off of them. So jumping back up to this one, all of these short little projections, these are called dendrites. These are specialized structures that allow this neuron to receive signals. So dendrites always carry signals towards the cell body. The axon, this word right here, the axon, this is a structure that carries signals away from the cell body. So we'll be talking a lot in this chapter about how conduction of signals takes place. And we'll be focused in on what's going on in this axon. There's gonna be a way that a signal can be sent down this axon. And then ultimately, um, where the signal would end up is the signal would get transmitted to an adjacent cell. So we'll be seeing how that happens. 
The axon, let's focus in on the axon for just a minute. The structure of an axon is really interesting. So there's a connection point, a connection to the cell body. And then beyond that, um, the length of the axon, this is variable from one neuron to another. There are some neurons where the axon is pretty short, like just a few millimeters, but there are other neurons where the axon would be very long. If you consider a neuron that runs the length of your leg, there's actually one axon that has to go that whole distance from essentially from the base of your spinal cord all the way down to your toes that would be one axon that has to descend that whole distance so these are cells that can be very long uh, up to a meter in length that axon is wrapped in some insulation and that insulation is called a myelin sheath and you'll notice there are some gaps in the myelin sheath. We'll be revisiting these gaps a little bit later on. Those gaps are very important for signal propagation. The gaps, I'm calling them gaps right now, their proper name is nodes of Ranvier. So again, we'll come back to this a little bit later on in the chapter. It's possible for axons to be branched. And in that case, we would say there are collaterals in the axon. Um, the fact that axons can potentially be really long, they can be up to a meter, this means that there are some special types of transport that have to be um, carried out throughout the axon. So this is part of the cell, right? It's going to require maintenance just like any normal cell um, would. And so the type of transport that happens down the axon, it's very dependent on the cytoskeleton. So remember the cytoskeleton provides sort of like the overall structure for a cell. Neurons are no different. Neurons have um, cytoskeletal fibers that run throughout the cell body and also down this axon. And down the axon, there are a couple of different types of transport that might happen. So some things um, that the cell wants to move, some things need to be moved quickly, and other things, it doesn't really matter if they get there quickly, it's okay if they go kind of slow. So there are different speeds of transport that can happen, and there are also different directions. Sometimes the cell might want to be shipping something down the axon away from the cell body. Other times it might be wanting to ship something in the other direction. So there are a couple of names on the slide here for those different directions. And I want to just draw kind of a little schematic. So if we, uh, if you just consider a microtubule, so that's what this line is, um, the way that transport can happen along this microtubule is by the use of what are called molecular motors. And you may or may not have heard of molecular motors before, it kind of depends on your background, but the one, uh, the one that's listed right here, kinesins, these are motors that particularly move things away from the cell body. And what a kinesin looks like, it's literally a walking protein. It has two things that look like legs, and then it has kind of a stalk. And then on the other end, it's capable of carrying vesicles. Okay, so here's a vesicle, this round thing is like a vesicle. And literally this um, motor protein, this kinesin, would walk in this direction down the microtubule. Um, so in the process, it's moving this vesicle and that vesicle could be, uh, could, could contain things that need to get to the end of the axon. So that would be called anterograde transport. It's moving away from the cell body, anterograde transport. There's another type of motor, a dynein, and dyneins carry things in the other direction. So we could have a dynein down here. It's kind of the same idea. It's a walking protein and it can carry things in the other direction. That would be called retrograde transport. So different types of transport, um, which are really important given that axons can be so long. We need to have specific transport processes in place. So all neurons have those three things in common. They all have a cell body, dendrites, and one axon. Um, but there are different categories of neurons in terms of what they do and what they, what they signal. So within the central nervous system, okay, so in, this is showing a picture of a schematic of a spinal cord, uh, within that central nervous system, there can be axons that are entirely contained. For example, this one right here, this is called an interneuron. 
Um, but then if we look at these other types, there are neurons that can leave. They, they might have a section that's in the central nervous system, but then most of the cell is out in the peripheral nervous system. And these are the types of neurons that allow us to sense things about our surroundings. So this one, literally, this is called a sensory neuron. It would have receptors down at this end and carry signals up this way towards, towards the central nervous system. Um, below that, we have a schematic of a somatic motor neuron. So here's the cell body, and then right here is a very long axon, which would end up leading to a muscle. This is the way that skeletal muscles can be signaled. So that's called a somatic motor neuron. We'll be talking a lot about motor neurons versus sensory neurons. Um, notice the difference in terms of placement of the cell body. So for sensory neurons, okay, the cell body is right here, but for motor neurons, it's actually housed in the central nervous system. The other type that's illustrated down here at the bottom, this is called an autonomic neuron. Um, this is an autonomic neuron that would signal things that we don't have conscious control over, so things like smooth muscle, cardiac muscle. This is going to be the topic for a later chapter. Um, for right now, we're going to be focused in pr primarily on these first two types, sensory neurons and motor neurons. When we use the name nerves, uh, so this means something different. This is, this is not the same thing as saying neuron. Okay, so neuron means one specific cell. A neuron is a cell. A nerve, on the other hand, is a bundle of axons. And nerves can be mixed. Some of, the, some of the axons in the bundle might be sensory axons. Others might be motor axons. Okay, so nerves, this is kind of a not a real precise term, but it's a useful term for referring to the fact that axons tend to be grouped in bundles as they um, extend from the central nervous system out to the more peripheral regions.